So I'd like to say welcome everyone to the April 2nd Saturday program. My name is Laura Morrison and I am the WCA programming chair. And today's program is Earth Day 2024, Exploring, Exploring Eco Ecological Art. Sorry for my tripping over that. I'm going to say that again. Earth Day 2024, Exploring Ecological Art uh, with Danielle Eubank. Um, I'd like to do a little bit of housekeeping first. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat or raise your hand using the reactions button at the bottom of your screen. Um, we can't see everyone at all at once. So if you physically raise your hand, I might not see you. So please use the reactions button. Um, there will be plenty of time for Q and A and some conversation at the end. And at that time you can unmute yourself and ask a question when it's your turn. Uh, we are recording the session, so you'll be able to access the recording in a week or so inside the membership portal on the WCA website. Um, just log in and you'll be able to view not only this program, but all of our Second Saturday programs that we've done so far. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, and without much further ado, I would like to in get started first with an introduction of Lisa Stavanaugh, who is our new, brand, brand, brand new Eco Art uh, Caucus Chair. Uh, Lisa is an American contemporary painter, mixed media artist, published author, creative instructor, photographer, and videographer, filmmaker. Lisa is a longtime environmental and women's rights activist whose fiery passion for the environment has given her the opportunity to work with people all over the country to inform and expand the dangers of ignoring climate change. She has works displayed in galleries and private collections across the United States and Canada. So welcome, Lisa. I'd like to um, uh, turn it over to you for a moment just to talk about what your plans are for the Eco Art Caucus um, in a few weeks. And um, after uh, you uh, talk about that, then we will move on to the program with Danielle. Hi, everybody. I'm Lisa. Um, I'm excited to be the director of the Eco of the Echo Art Caucus. I have a lot of great ideas, but our first meeting is going to be on Earth Day, and I would love it if you could all come. And we're going to talk, get to know each other. I'd like to share everybody to share a piece of their work, talk about what you're doing in your areas for the environment, what's going on, and we will build the caucus together. That's gonna be our focus, working together to get the word out about climate change and just making this place a better, you know, better. And what time will that be? It will be at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Okay. 6 p.m. Yeah, I'll do all the math, but it's 7 p.m. Eastern. And I will send that link out next week. I'm working with Karin uh, to get Zoom permissions. Great. All right. Very good. Um, why don't you put your um, email in the chat so people can uh, contact you right away if they like. Okay. All right. Still admitting a couple more people. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. Okay. So now we're going to get started with the program um, with Danielle Eubank. Danielle well, Eubank. Oh, say hi, Danielle. I'm going to introduce you. Hello. Okay. <laughs> People know which, which box I am. <laughs> oh, hold on. Let me unspotlight. Lisa. And I'm going to spotlight Danielle. All right. There you are. All right. I'm going to uh, do your, your bio introduction, and then we'll uh, turn it right over to you. So. Danielle Eubank explores the relationship between abstraction and realism through painting water. She's a recipient of the Paula Krasner Foundation grant. Danielle created One Artist, Five Oceans, a 20 year project where she sailed and painted the waters of every ocean on earth to raise climate awareness. Eubank is currently painting some of the most polluted waters in the United States, including the Gowanus Canal, New York, a super fun site, and the San Francisco Bay, California, multiple Superfund sites, in order to heighten awareness of the urgency for redress and protection of these waters in our neighborhoods. 
Eubank has been the expedition artist for multiple exped expeditions and rec recreations of ancient sailboats. She was a 2018 Creative Climate Award nominee and the awardee of the WCA United Nations Program Honor Roll Award for 2019. So welcome, Danielle. Great to see everybody. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you for putting this together. And I think um, uh, Sandra is out of the country, so Laura's had to do this on her on her lonesome. So well done. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> um, so uh, in in classic uh, format, I'm going to uh, sort of introduce myself and tell you what I'm going to tell you. And then um, and then we all get to talk about um, ideas that everybody here has. Um, so if anybody has any objections, let me know. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm really, really excited to be talking to you guys today. And I've come through, um, well, I just come through a lot of realizations lately about um, the way that we approach uh, environmental art and addressing environmental concerns. Um, a lot of us, including myself, have been making environmental art for a long time. And we have environmental shows and it's great. It's really great. You get to re reuse things. You get to talk about issues that you're very passionate about. But then what? I always kind of leave these shows thinking, well, now what? How do we how do we affect lasting change? Um, so at this point, I'm going to share my screen so that you don't have to look at my mug anymore. Let's see, um, okay. So do you see do you see the screen? Which screen do you see? It says Earth Day 2022. How to okay, create okay. environmental change? Doesn't yes. have the because there's you know how PowerPoint has the anyway. Um, okay, yeah. So, so I've been thinking a lot about this, right? We, like we make we make this great work. We're very excited about it. We have these shows, and then what? Um, so, how do we turn our art and our passion about the environment into actual positive action for the environment? And that's what I want to kind of focus on today, because that's what's really been on my mind a lot. You know, how do we take it to the next level? Um, it can look it can look a lot of different ways, right? Uh, everyone has different things that they're passionate about. Everything has a different approach and, and a different philosophy. But it seems to me that the key lies somewhere within community. It seems like working together is going to create a lot more powerful voice. Um, and how do we how do we do that within our own passions and our own artwork styles and so forth. So um, for example, I have an idea for a project um, which um, hopefully will be in the newsletter for in one of these few months that would just involve a tiny little effort from a whole bunch of us in this group. And then together, you know, we could we could work, we would be stronger, our voices would be stronger. Um, for, and also on that line, um, if you, during our talk today, have ideas for projects that you would like me to be a part of, by all means, um, email me. Um, I'll put my email address in the chat when I'm not talking. Um, and if you have ideas that you want other people to be involved in, um, please put those in the chat for everybody. And then in the future, if you do have some ideas, um, Lisa has very kindly said that um, it's okay to email her and her email address already is in the chat. So if there are projects that you want to work with others on, um, sound good? Yes. Good, yeah. love it. Um, and let's see, so that was my sort of house, house cleaning. Um, so, I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna tell you. So this is what I'm really thinking about right now. The artwork, it seems to me, is a launching point for the environmental work and vice versa too, right? Sometimes you're working on something about the environment and that inspires a great art piece. But it seems that what I'm mostly talking about here is there's something wrong. There's something I wanna fix in my work. 
And so it comes out through my art and that's how I deal with it. And that's also how I uh, communicate my ideas with other people. And then taking that to the next level, how do we create momentum for lasting positive change in the environment? Not just a bunch of pretty shows, pretty shows are great, but what's next? You know, there's got, there's absolutely got to be more to it than that. All right, a little bit about my background. Um, I am an expedition artist um, and what that means, this is me painting a boat while the boat is being built um, next to me. Um, I, li I, like, I like this slide because it shows what great concentration artists have to have. There's a guy like chainsawing literally 10 feet from me <laughs> without any protective gear or anything. This is in Syria. Um, so you got to really look. I'm not seeing a slide. I'm really sorry, but oh. I don't know. Is anyone else? Um, I, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing you painting while he's... What we see is expedition. I'm seeing you. Yeah, we yeah. see it. With the, with the chainsaw. With the chainsaw? Yeah. Yeah, we see it. Something's wrong with me. I'm going to rejoin, okay? Okay. Something's wrong with my Zoom. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think that's what we do as artists. We have um, a superpower, which is that we're super observant people and that we're passionate. I guess that's two superpowers. So I like to think that I really look so that others can really look. You know, a lot of people say after seeing my work about water, which you'll see in a second, that they notice water in a different way than they ever have before. Yeah. And my hope is that we can help instill passion in other people. Uh, one of the expeditions that I was the expedition artist for was the Borobudur ship expedition. It was a recreation of an 8th century Indonesian vessel, um, and we sailed uh, from near Bali to Jakarta and then um, across the Indian Ocean and around the Cape of Good Hope up the west coast of Africa. Another expedition that I was part of is uh, that I was the expedition artist for is the Phoenicia ship expedition. Herodotus said that the Phoenicians were the first people to circumnavigate Africa in 600 BCE, a long time before the Portuguese, like 2000 years before the Portuguese. <laughs> so there's, there's a history and there's, you know, there's a culture and there's all kinds of, all kinds of social economic stuff that goes on in these projects. And they're giant collaborative projects, which is super fun. Um, this is a, a photo that I took um, while we were building the Phoenicia so I, that's what I was looking at. And these are the tools that I use when I'm out and about, the most important being the cup of coffee, because um, this is sort of at five in the morning in Syria. And as you can see, and as I'm sure you've seen in your own practices, it's really, it's really crappy, right? Like there's just rubbish there. Um, not just my, not just my paints, but there's like actual rubbish and you're sitting there and there's rats walking by and that's what it's like in these shipyards. Um, and I think that it's immensely ironic that where I'm sitting right in that point, that is one of the oldest Phoenician sites in the world or one of the best preserved Phoenician sites in the world. Phoenicians <clears throat> were around you know, thousands of years ago, right? Like the the Punic Wars, Punic was the Roman word for Phoenician. The Punic Wars were in what, like 133, something like that. And so I'm sitting there, there are these 2000 year old artifacts, I guess you could call that pollution too in a way, artifacts, walls and things from the Phoenicians. And then there's all this crap everywhere. Um, so what do I paint from that point? I paint this. So this is one of my paintings um, also from that same place in Syria. And this is what I was looking at. There are baby strollers and rugs and mattresses and of course, plastic bottles everywhere. So what I like to do is I like to take a view like this. This is a reflection of the Phoenician ship and turn it into this. Um, sometimes I include, you know, cigarette butts and drinks bottles and things in my paintings. Um, but it's it's kind of, I'd rather be the carrot than the stick, right? So I'd rather get people to try and look at the work and then say, hey, by the way, this is what it really looks like. 
you know, that's what's really going on. Um, this was behind me. So this is all the same place. And not to single out Syria, um, I've sailed every ocean on the planet and I've been to all but one continent and you see this every single place. California, England, Scotland, the Arctic, Antarctica. I saw tons of pollution. I was uh, very surprised. Um, all right, so next expedition. Um, this is, I think a couple of you have, have been on this. This is more of a artist at residency um, to the high Arctic um, uh, and on um, this three-masted barkentine vessel. That's somebody I met there. <laughs> <laughs> They're easily my favorite animal now. I love walruses now. Um, and then to the Southern Ocean. So hopefully you can see the vessel right above the SOU of Southern um, gives you a little bit of scale um, for uh, where I was in uh, Antarctica. So these are some of the places that I've been. The red lines are some of the places I've been merely merely to say that um, I'm kind of a documentarian by nature. I think I'm kind of a collector. I like to collect places. I co like to collect bodies of water. Um, these are oceans, but I've also painted a lot of uh, uh, well, hundreds of rivers and lakes and and bays and and things like that. Okay, so now what? I've collected all this information. I've collected all this data. So now you have a show. Okay, great. You have a bunch of shows. Um, these are a couple of my paintings. These are um, six feet by um, ten feet paintings of the Arctic. Here's another one of my paintings of the Arctic. These are all oil on linen canvas. This is the Pacific Ocean from Taiwan. The Atlantic Ocean from Scotland. My goal with these paintings is, as I mentioned, to get people to really look, but also to um, create a, a kind of a mood, to create um, emotion in the viewer. And this is the Indian Ocean. This is actually a reflection of a, of a police boat up on stilts from Beira, Mozambique. And this is five feet by six feet. And then finally, the Southern Ocean. Um, this is 60 inches by 42 inches. Um, and this was my final ocean to paint. And so I think um, this was a 20 year project, by the way. So I think by the time that I have been painting this ocean, I would say that I felt like the documentarian part of me had been satisfied. And so I was able to have been able to uh, get a little bit more um, into the water as it were, rather than being on top of it, documenting it, actually feel like I'm in it, exploring it and expressing it. All right, now my current project is um, I'm looking at super fun sites, as Laura very kindly said in the intro. Um, I'm also looking at uh, water that has been redressed or is in the process of being fixed up. Um, and I'm starting to look more at community. You know, what? how are these water sources important to the communities that they're in and how has community shaped these water sources? The Gowanus Canal, this is a photograph of the Gowanus Canal that I took, um, is a great example. The Gowanus Canal was created. It wasn't originally you know, a canal. It was a little creek that was used by the native people that were there. And then um, when the Europeans came over then the 19th century, relatively recently, actually, they said, hey, this would be a really great way to ship things from, you know, Brooklyn to New York. Let's let's make it into a canal. And then all of their um, activities made it 
you know, quite polluted, famously polluted. A lot of you probably know a heck of a lot more about it than I do being out here on the West Coast, but um, it's pretty famous for this man-made problem that we uh, that we created and now are fixing up. So humans ruined it, but humans can also fix it. So there's there's a lot of positive in energy in that. Uh, this is Alameda Island. Um, these are snapshots more. I'm going to show you the artwork that I created from them. I have a show on um, at Pamela Walsh Gallery in Palo Alto right now, which is talking about the Bay Area and some of the super fun sites there. Um, Alameda Island is a, a old air base and um, was used a lot in the Second World War. Um, before that, uh, it was an airport, like, you know, when, when planes were just getting going. It was a ferry terminal. Before that, it was a peninsula, but, you know, humans made it into, into an island. Um, before that, it was a marshy oak forest um, that, the, uh, that the Ohlone lived in. So, but this is what we've done to it. And it's got um, about 25 Superfund sites, including one on the national priorities list, which is the worst of the worst. So the Superfund sites are sites that the Environmental Protection Agency has deemed um, the most polluted. And the if the companies, the, the, there's no money or anything like that that comes from the EPA. It's more of a designation. Like they don't come in and do it. They they monitor it. Um, companies are supposed to clean it up, but sometimes um, it's it's hard to pin responsibility on any one company or any one organization. For example, in this case, the military. Um, so they uh, uh, do oversee it. I'm not super clear on the ins and outs of how that works, how that functions. But that's kind of what a super fund site is. Um, they're really, really polluted places. And then the national priorities list, there's one, this place where this photograph is from is, is from that point. This is the Petaluma River um, in Sonoma County in um, California. That's uh, for those of you that don't know, it's um, north of San Francisco. So there goes San Francisco and then there goes Marin County and then there goes Sonoma County. Um, you've probably had wine from there. Now the Petaluma River is really interesting place because it's, um, well, I'm sort of from there, so I find it really interesting, <laughs> but um, it has been used to provide sustenance to the greater Bay Area. It feeds, it, it runs south and it feeds into the, into the San Francisco Bay, what we call the San Francisco Bay. And since, since the um, Miwok Indians lived there, um, they gave it the name Petaluma. It has been a source of food and a source of transporting food, primarily some goods too. And then when it was part of Mexico, it was also used for this. In fact, the first grapevines, I believe, were planted by General um, Vallejo or Vallejo. Um, and ever since then, and to this day, it is the way that we get all of the food. It was used to, um, and wine and, and other things, it was used to supply all the gold miners with all of their supplies. So I find that really interesting. And here's Palo Alto. Palo Alto is a great uh, success story. This is um, the Charleston Slough and a lot of different birds and things um, are living there now. It's been being restored for about 15 years. It was a salt pond. The salt ponds also were created for the gold miners. Um, it's a natural, it's in the kind of south uh, west corner, if you will, of the San Francisco Bay. Um, and um, so it's a naturally salty area that doesn't have a lot of uh, way, places for the water to escape. So it's a great place to mine salt. If you've ever flown into SFO and you see um, the multicolored ponds, if you guys ever seen those, I always thought they were like sewer treatment plants but they're actually old salt ponds from, you know, 100 years ago. 
Yeah. Um, so that's a success story. They've they've gotten rid of the salt pond and there are all kinds of really gorgeous birds. And of course, lots of people running and walking and, and using the land as well. All right, so this is the work that I've made from these, the Gowanus Canal. You can actually see that painting behind me as well. I didn't realize that when I made this for you. It's like a double thing. <laughs> um, and this is, I think, 60, the 42 by 66 inches. Um, and it, I'm talking about the personality of the water in this. My work always uses real life um, uh, eddies and flows and shapes from the water itself, because that's that's part of the game that I play is I like to um, make sure that it's a portrait of that actual place and, and give physics its due. <laughs> you know, it's important to me to get it right. This is the Petaluma River. So in this one, I'm um, taking the paint and using the liquidity of the actual paint to help communicate that kind of slow river type of personality that the Petaluma River has. Alameda Island, this is from the ferry terminal, one of the ferry terminals that takes people um, back and forth to um, San Francisco, the city. Um, and it's really about the energy and the mess and what's going on um, in the East Bay versus the West Bay, which we don't really call it that. It's just the East Bay and the Bay. <laughs> Doesn't make sense. But anyway, that's what we do. <laughs> and finally, Palo Alto and kind of the, I guess, the joy in a way that I feel in this space and the way that it's improved. It's great to have some success stories. So that's a pretty good summary of what I've been working on recently. Um, so just to reiterate the, the artwork, at least for me, it's a, a launching point for the environmental work, right? So I've given a lot of talks, you know, I've made the art, I've given the talks, I've had, you know, put multiple news articles and blogs and various things out there. I've been on lots of committees, but now what, you know, how do you take that energy? How do you take that knowledge? How do you take all that observation and create lasting change? I think we need to work together. Um, I think if we work together, we're going to have a lot bigger voice. So for example, it, we could all say, no, you know, I don't want that dam built or no, we, we can't have salmon fishing here any, you know, anymore, or we need to create whatever, whatever thing that, you know, each of us is, is passionate about. Also together, we have more economic power. You know, if all of us said, no, I'm not going to buy any more yogurt in, you know, polystyrene cups or whatever, then they would listen. Even if, you know, each of us here got a couple of friends to do something like that, then the companies would, would listen. So that's why it's so important for us to work together. Um, Maybe I should actually pause for questions before we do our break out, break out, break out room. What do you think, Laura? Yeah, that sounds good. So what do you want to um, take the questions while your email, your um, slides up or you want to go back to the group? Um, let's go back to the group for a second. All right. Then... So unshare your screen. OK, so I have to get back to Zoom. Bear with me here. Zoom. There we go. All right. Okay. So does anyone have any questions so far for Danielle? Raise your hand if you could. And then, so the reactions put, button is at the bottom. Put my email in here. And if you want to unpin, unpin Danielle, we can see each other if you want. Okay. So Danielle, do you want to talk a little bit about um, 
your grant um, raising, you know, so that you were able to go on these expeditions and and paint these amazing um, bodies of water. Yeah, sure. Um, so um, thank you, Dallas. Um, uh, the first expedition I was on was the Borbador. I have to do it chronologically because that's how my brain works. Um, the the Borbador ship expedition, and um, that one I was very lucky in that the expedition covered all of my um, expenses, so I was lucky with that one. And then the next expedition that I was part of. Um, they covered a certain part of it, a little bit of it, but um, uh, I just went on, um, not GoFundMe, but the other one, and um, what's the other one called? Kickstarter? Sorry? Kickstarter. Kickstarter, mm -hmm. Did a big Kickstarter push um, for the next one and was able to raise funds to go um, with Phoenicia on that one. And then, um, the third one I uh, just paid for out of pocket, which was very painful. And then um, I'm very hard to do. I'm, I'm just, you know, an ordinary guy. Um, and then uh, the la the most recent expedition, I did another Kickstarter uh, fundraiser, and that was very successful. Was that the one to the South Pole? Yes. 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 I got a lovely little piece back from you for that. Yes, thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, I actually um, actually kind of funny. Was it was yours the um one of the postcards? Yes. The hand hand painted postcards. Yeah. So it was kind of interesting. Um one thing that we got to do is we got to go to the Ukrainian um research center um and they mailed my uh postcards to people and um I believe they took, we were the last boat in before the whole thing froze over. And so they were all locked in there. We got out and they were locked in there. So they couldn't mail um, any letters or communicate with people in that way. They couldn't get any ships in and out for eight months. Right. Yeah. yeah. I was pretty, delighted when it finally showed up. Yeah, that was, that was ridiculous. Cool. It was wonderful. Um, <laughs> Bonnie asks, uh, curious, have you been selling these marvelous works? Did yes. A show? Yeah, I do sell them. Yeah. Yeah. I've been, I've been very, very lucky in selling my work. Do we have any other questions? Uh, Tanner, you can ask your question. Hi, that's um, my husband's name. <laughs> it's, it's, oh, um, sorry. Computer. That's what I see on the no, screen. No, yeah. no, it's, the, it's the home computer. <laughs> um, Ellen Maidman Tanner. I also do. Uh, sometimes I do paintings about the um, deterioration of the parklands near where I live. And it's amazing because even when you're doing that, and I, I, your work resonates with me because what we're seeing is the beauty and the breakdown. There's a wonderful song by Fru Fru along those lines with a lyric, the beauty and the breakdown. And what you're doing when you're painting that polluted water, you can't help it. You're an artist. You're seeing the beauty of that composition. If you're not there talking about what those paintings are, they're beautiful abstractions. And I think for many of us, there's a real schizophrenia. We do what we do because our eyes and hands work the way they do. But the message is so much more complex and pressing. And um, so it's it's a it's a question. It's a it's just mu constant musing. How do we do more? How do we go beyond these wonderful things that we enjoy making, that we sell, that, you know, that's not actually helping this dire situation, this dire climate situation. On LinkedIn, of all places, there are several individuals who are working at global scale, and they're uniting businesses, writers, artists, and I think I don't know if that's an avenue, Danielle, that you've ever contemplated. One of them, one of the people that I'm very, very impressed by is a man named Stephen Fern, F-E-R-N. And he has been doing some extremely innovative coalition building. And I think that 
one of the ways we eventually have a much bigger impact is through those coalitions, is joining on with the scientists. I, you've done it. I mean, you've done it through navigation. You've done it by joining with people who have, who are passionate about the climate like you are, but probably have very different professional interests and are traveling those waters for different for different reasons. So my question to you then becomes all of this did, distilled down. Have you looked into this whole area of artists working with scientists, digital innovators, business corporations, whoever you can get your hands on to, to promote this idea that we need to do more? Y yes, yes. And um, the first the first part of what you were talking about, I I want to say that I agree, we do tend to make things beautiful or at least interesting. And I have had a lot of guilt around that. Mm -hmm. of, totally understand. I feel, I feel bad because I feel in the first part of your question, I feel like, oh no, I did it wrong, right? Like, like, um, oh God, you're making it beautiful. You're supposed to make change. And I think that's natural. We probably all have felt a little bit of that, like, oh God damn it. It's a pretty little picture of water unless I told people that it's all like all the fish right. are dead, right? But I think that back to um, what, I, what I started to say um, in the beginning of the talk, I, I think that's the launching point. That's where, you know, you're at a conference or at an exhibition or heck, people at your house or whatever. And, and they're like, wow, look at that pretty picture of water. And you're like, yeah, guess what? Guess what's happening right now? And then, and then you can have those conversations. I feel like if I were to have a bunch of paintings of dead fish and I'm all for it, but if that were the example, people might kind of close up and not want to um to and to the to the so that's my way of getting out of the guilt or or maybe i'm just being defensive <laughs> um, um and then the the second part of that is yeah absolutely um i'm definitely want to work with as many scientists and historians and you know people that make links um between other people um i like to think of it as the kind of mothers against drunk driving effect you know, I think uh, back in the whenever that was 70s or 80s, there were a lot of people that were dying from drinking and driving, but it was kind of an accepted thing. And I think that there were a lot of people that were really pissed off, but it wasn't until a lot of it wasn't just mothers, but a lot of people got together and said, this is not tolerable. We are a bigger voice. We're going to make stuff happen so we could all talk to scientists and historians. But we like you said, we really need to create a bigger a bigger community of people to make changes happen. Good yep. comments. Uh, let's go. The next person who raised her hand was Lisa Stepanov. Yes. Um, Danielle, <clears throat> excuse me. I am putting together a huge environmental show. Um, it's what if, what is. And one gallery, the what if, what if we had listened and it has, <clears throat> excuse me, artwork portraying you know this beautiful world if we had listened all those years ago and what is world is what is happening right now and um the whole thing I mean there's going to be a fashion show dance performance artist I mean it's huge and you just gave me a great idea to how to follow up and work with environmental organizations where the show is going to be and my hope is that the show can move to different cities as it goes so I would my question is would it be okay if I emailed you later and kind of talk to you more about the kickstarter fundraising aspect yeah absolutely absolutely I'm happy to if I can if I can help anybody in any way try and get these messages out try and get your work out then I am very happy to I don't know I don't know how useful I'll be, but I'm very happy to lend whatever I can. Okay. And the second part is I would love for some of your work to be in the show. So I will keep you informed when I get to that part. And if you're interested. Yeah. Would... Okay. Yeah. Whatever I can do, whatever I can do to help. I want to, 
I want to work together, all of us. Great. Because my focus is more land, but also ocean. So in the show. Perfect. Great. Wonderful. All right. Uh, next uh, was Beatrice. Yeah. What do we do about Amazon? <laughs> it, it's not, it, it, I don't know. I have a real pet peeve with people ordering things that they can go to the store with um, and including the environment with the cardboard, with the cars, with the gas, with, with everything. And I, yeah. Well, well I'll tell you something, Beatrice. Um, that's a great thing to talk about in the breakout rooms and also yeah. um, this project idea that I alluded to. Um, I don't have it fully fleshed out yet, but I'll just give you the kind of what I've worked out so far. Um, it needs to be, um, it's going to be kind of a, a climate thermometer, if you will, uh, pun intended. Um, it's going to be 100 times 100. So I'm going to get 100 of you and me and everybody that we can to write a letter or I think a letter would is pretty powerful about something they're they're passionate about and maybe you know yours is about amazon and and what we need to do with them and then i'm going to create um a page on my website that's like pass protected where everybody can access everybody else's letters so that everybody can send, can change the details with their names and send out those letters so that we create this massive hopefully snowball of voices addressing the cares and concerns that each of us has. Maybe it'll work. Right. Sounds wonderful. All right, we're gonna go on to, thank you, Beatrice. We're gonna go on to Stephanie. I have um, a few questions. One's technical, but you were mentioning that you are painting with oil. I use water soluble oils because it's safer for the environment. It looked though, like you said, they were flowing. What kind of oil paint are you using? I use old Holland oil paint. Um, they use, I don't use any of the uh, artificial, artificial, can you say that with, when it's not? No, oil? I said um, water soluble. They changed a molecule. It's still oil paint, but it can be washed by saddle soap. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, was your question what kind of paint I use? Yeah, like how do you, with, are you thinning it down or are you glazing? Or are you watering it? Oh, or I it wouldn't be watering, yeah. but. So I, I use regular hand soap, regular glycerin soap um, to wash my brushes in. It works great. Great. Um, I have, uh, where I live in Los Angeles, I have a septic tank. So I everything has to be, and I would anyway, uh, be safe for that. Um, I thin my paints using um, the Gamsol, the Gamblin um, uh, Mineral Spirits. It's yeah. got the lowest VOC um, that archivists will actually approve of. I've tried using some other chemicals, but I talked to a, uh, I've talked to archivists and they say that they will actually destroy anything that has white um, in your paint, which is which is a lot. <laughs> so I use Gamsol for that. Um, what else? Oh, and I clean my brushes using um, citrus oil. Like, okay. when, like I just have a big thing of citrus oil and I just dunk them in there. Yeah. My next thing was, um, it's a couple, but I too have a show coming up and um, thank you. And I invited a couple of, I'm from Detroit and I invited some environmental groups to come with their displays and explain what they're doing to help the local environment. I also invited another artist who did love letters to Belle Isle because I'm trying to make it a community event that might bring home messages besides my artwork. And the letters to Belle Isle was the spirituality and the healing process of nature. So I felt like it was a full circle event and that was my goal with it so it was really exciting to hear lisa <laughs> doing a similar project um and then finally i have an artist in residency in the um la gomera which is in the Camary islands off the coast of africa 
And I'm wondering, like, when you were doing these expeditions, were you using your oil paint? Did it have time to dry? Did you use acrylics? Like, what kind of packing did you do to be, because you were just carrying this stuff on. I'm not, you know, how did you manage to get all this with you, the art supplies? Good, good question. Yeah, so I, um, when I circumnavigated Africa, um, I didn't, well, anyway, when I was in Africa for six months, Asia and Africa for six months, one of the times, um, I took everything with me, including all the canvas, because I really, I, I really didn't Right, know. I have to do that too. Yeah, and then, um, uh, I so I recommend doing that. I recommend if there's something you think you use a lot more of, like say white paint or something, I would take more of that. Um, funny short story, I was in Cape Town for four months, literally waiting for my ship to come in. And um, I ran out of white paint. And so I, and I had, uh, you know, made some friends while I was there. It was long enough to kind of set up a studio and make some friends. And so they drove me around to all the different art stores and there wasn't any white paint. So in Cape Town, there wasn't any white paint. Um, it's, we forget, you know, where we all live, even those of us that live in the countryside, that we can access anything, whether it's through Amazon or whether it's through, you know, whatever, Dick Blick or whatever, we can get anything we want. But in these places, you can't. And certainly in the Canary Islands, that will be the case. So I was at this one store and I, I must have seemed pretty desperate. I was like, you really don't have any white paint. I've been to every art store in Cape Town. And this woman came up to me, this, this customer came up to me and she said, I have some. She wow. said, my, 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 whatever, my mom or whatever, my aunt left me some paints and you can have mine. Oh my God. And so I said, okay. I, and so we, re, we agreed to meet at like a cafe because I didn't know who she was or anything. And she didn't know who I was. And she gave me all her paints. And I think I have one little half a tube of a color that I don't use very much still. Um, so, so, you know, definitely take what you need, but also remember that if you go around and make friends with everybody, probably somebody will help you out because they'll be used to being in those kinds of situations mm -hmm. where you have to work together to get what you need. Thanks. That's a, that's a nice story. Um, mm -hmm. A couple of questions, and then why don't we move to the breakout rooms? So let's do Olga and Kelly. Because I want to have time to do more discussion after the breakout rooms. Uh, I uh, first I have a general question for everyone. Are there anybody from New York? Is there anyone here from New York? Yes. If you are from New York, uh, could you kind of let me know in chat? Because I have some uh, project um, and I even did not start it because I need help. I would not be able to do it um, to do it uh, by myself. It's one thing. And second, I just wanted to make a, a comment because um, right now we we start to talk a lot about indigenous cultures in their relationship with nature and usually it was kind kind of how their relationship have like uh, ritualistic nature and um, it was much much more no intimate and for example if you say someone that uh, uh, scientific reason for that and for that people would would not probably listen but if you say somewhere it's a bad sign to put something bad in the water in in river and it will return you as return to you as a disease and it's a bad sign. It's absolutely scientific because it will return to us as a disease. But people will listen much more. You see, then if to the it's a bad sign, it it's stuck with them much more than if you tell about 
many really scientific facts. So that's probably one of the tools that we can use, but how to use it, it's, it's, also, it's, also, it's also very difficult to, to understand. That's, that's probably it. Okay. Olga, are you in New York City? Is that where you live? Yes. Okay, because there's not a chapter there. So um, yes. Okay, so if anyone wants to connect with Olga, um, go ahead and Olga, why don't you, um, I'm going to put my email in the chat. And um, maybe and if you if you can give me an idea later about what your project is, I might be able to connect you with some people in New York. I could I could say what is uh, what right now. There is okay. a lot of areas without any uh, uh, without no a lot of areas just empty without any plants anything and. Uh, and it could be it could be done something there, but it has to be connected again to scientists who um, kind of provide uh, information about what kind of plants could be there, what is not invasive, what kind of seeds, and and that and that and that and you know, a lot of a lot of people should be in you know investing in it somehow. That it's I cannot pull it my up by myself. That's it. Thanks. Okay. Sure. Okay, last question. Thank you, Olga. Uh, Kelly. Hi. Um, I just had a question about kind of going back to slowing down to reveal your context. They look at your paintings, oh, that's nice, or this is what I think, and then move on. And it's just kind of a broader question. How do we slow people down to look past the first impression of a work? and discover that deeper context. Thanks. That's that's um, something that I've been interested in my whole professional life. Um, and I'm, I'm just as guilty as anyone. I'm like, yep, seen it next. Yep, seen it next. Yep, click, click, slide, slide, you know, <laughs> right? Um, I, I don't know about you guys, maybe this is just, super personal, but the artwork for me that at first I go, wow, is usually the one that I'm least interested in for the longest amount of time. It's usually the work that has more subtlety or nuance to it, different layers. Um, you know, if, if only we were all Shakespeare, right? Where there was a little something for everyone in your piece. Um, I'm not, I think that I think that creating things that relate to people's lives is a good way to do it because then they tend to be more interested. Um, I also think that the way that art is sometimes displayed is very um, old fashioned and off-putting. You know, there is kind of, um, an elite thing and don't get me wrong I'm all for the elite right like we got to have people that are out there pioneering stuff and learning stuff and writing books and giving lectures and I'm all for it but I do think that if we want to reach a broader audience like Shakespeare did then we need to come to wherever they are um, and and present work in a way that is approachable to them getting them to slow down that's that's harder. Um, but I like how in the last kind of 30 years, um, you see art in more places. It seems to me like that's really taken off. I don't know if you guys agree with wherever you guys live, but there's a lot more art in public places. There's art in, um, you know, I'll be going for a hike. And honestly, when I'm going for a hike, I don't want to see anything man-made on that person. But I do appreciate that there is work out there for other people to enjoy. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe it's a broader question. Like let's stop and have coffee with our friends. Let's go for walks with our friends. Let's, um, or alone, let's slow all those things down that need to be slowed down. And then, and then have meaningful conversations, not just, oh, look at the headlines. Look at what so-and-so said today, you know? Um, maybe it's, well, what, what, 
do you think about the way that that leaf overlaps that tree? Have you ever stopped and thought about how that works, you know, or how, why, why are trees shaped that way? You know, I don't know. My, my two cents. Hope that helps Kelly. I don't know. <laughs> All right, so um, Danielle, you wanted us to go to breakout rooms to okay. address a couple questions. Do you want to share your screen again with and to, uh, or or do you yeah. want to talk? About I'm going to share my screen again, and um, so these are the two questions I thought people could um, address, both of them or one of them or none of them. But this is the a good launching point. How do we work together to create a snowball effect, right? Bigger change or, and, or what is an idea to create lasting positive change amongst the population? So one is how do we work together as a group? And the other is how do we get everybody else to work together as a group? Like, for example, the question that we were just talking about, how do we get everybody else to slow down? How do we get everybody else to stop buying blah, blah, blah? Okay. I'm just writing this down to create last. Does anybody have any questions about what those questions mean? Any questions, anybody? No, okay. So um, why don't we, I'm going to go, there's 30 people. I think I'm going to go to six breakout rooms and we'll have um, five people in each room. And then how long uh, would you say we'd like to, to chat? What do you guys think? Five minutes, eight minutes so that we have time to share our ideas afterwards? All right, everyone, welcome back. We had a couple of problems. Someone couldn't hear each other in their breakout room, I hope. Did everyone else work out okay? Yeah, we, we were, we're able good. to talk. Yeah. Okay, you know, full disclosure, breakout rooms, are I've only done them a few times. <laughs> so I do so with a fair amount of peril in my heart, you know, is this going to work? Um, so I'm glad it worked for most everyone. So Danielle, why don't we, you, I think you had, you're on mute. Um, unmute yourself and why don't you um, kind of take it over? How, how do you want to do the last uh, part of this program then? With um, well, I think, it would, I think it'd be really great if um, somebody from each of the groups um, talked through some of the things that they discussed. Um, I know our group didn't come up with any answers, but we did have a, a pretty good discussion. So maybe maybe don't set your expectations too high. If you didn't solve all the world's problems in seven minutes, I think that's okay. <laughs> um, so maybe maybe somebody from each group could talk. All right, so someone wanna raise their hands? Uh, Stephanie, I see you. I thought we had a very good discussion and we can't, we did not solve the problem either, Deborah, D Danielle, but we sort of went towards the eco group um, doing, being the lead and taking, you know, trying to come up with a plan in which anyone who does commit, commits. And in their own personal schedule, they set aside an hour a week to work on their aspect of the project or all of our aspects of the project. But the, the thing about the project is, what is it? How do we focus? There's so many environmental issues. Do we want to be specific? Do we want to take it one climate issue at a time. I mean, you go from super fracking to water to, you know, it's, it's a very big, broad subject. And is, you incorporate the political, the social, and how do you do that? But that's kind of where we left off. All right, very good. 
Um, let's go to Christine. Uh, let's see, Christina. Christina. I think you have to unmute, Christina. Sorry. You're muted, yeah, Christina. Here, let me see if I can unmute you. I got it now. I'm okay. sorry about that. All right. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to report out from our group. We had a wonderful um, short convo, I think really focusing on intersectionality and um, thinking a lot about going from, this was from um, Dallas's comment about her work, I would believe about materials to like materiality and materials to place to people to like systemic harm and thinking about bringing those connections forward through artist statements, talks um, and engaging folks in conversation and I would add that um, I've found it helpful to really focus on water for myself in my practice. I've been involved with this group I put in the chat called globalwaterdances.org. It's a very cool um, place-based activist project. And there's certainly a lot of room for visual artists, composers, and other you know, folks to join in. And the dancing part of it is simple enough that anyone can do it. And um, the way that it's impact me is that when I'm working on global water dances, it's biennial, I am more conserving of water. It's like phenomenal how that happens. And um, it's, it's not even something I have to think about doing. It just kind of springs up, you know, or wells up. So I love this idea that we can um, start small and still make impacts, which Steph was talking about, which I appreciate. It's like, we can't take it all on and um, limiting, you know, where we're focusing, but then also sharing that out to our communities, I think is a, is a great strategy. Right. All right, let's go to Laura Earl. Hey, everybody, I'm calling in from Texas today. Um, I had a great conversation uh, with Anne and Perry, and we were discussing how the role of an artist is often to be very observant and to draw to people's attention, something that they might have missed on their own. But the challenge is what next? So uh, we talked a little bit about the importance of coming up with a doable next step. Now that they have been made aware and they're interested, can we point them in the right direction so that they can take that energy and, and put it into some form of progress? So we talked about the possibility of partnering with other organizations that could help them with their that step. They happen to be um, already lined up with the direction that we were hoping to promote, then we can hand them off essentially. Um, the other thing is, uh, I was thinking about the uh, idea of all of us sending letters, which is great. Uh, but I also know that if we all sent one letter to 100 different places, it's a very small impact. But if we chose a specific goal, and we send 100 letters to one place, it's a much louder voice. So I think the idea of, of really making a selection and making a choice and then uh, um, pulling all of our resources together into one message is much more potentially effective. Um, and then the third thing was something that Perry said that I thought was so great was talking about, um, talking about things in terms of goals and um, creating community. So like if we set a, a measurable goal and then have a feedback loop to be able to continue, hey, how did it go? You know, this is what we set out to do and some way of measuring it and then coming back together as a community to say, what was the measurable impact? And I think that that part is really important because if we continue this practice of giving ourselves next steps, then we can have that snowball effect uh, over time. And, and Perry, please jump in and jump in if I've forgotten something. I know we talked about so much. More. Um, I, I mean, I guess I might just want to add that one of the ways that in my work I had a lot, I saw a positive impact was directly working with community and having like a public art project where I use the concepts that I use in my own paintings, um, but I took it to run workshops where I had community drawing. And then out of the community drawings, there were so many conversations that were taking place because my project was about processing the pandemic. And then we displayed it as a big public art 
he's in Palo Alto, actually, on the front of Rinconada Library. But it was really, I mean, my husband's not a visual artist, so he's like, you know, in talking to you and hearing about your project, it really seems like the the success of this project was in the conversations that people were having in those workshops, because it was all different ages, um, all different races, all together, drawing, but communicating. And it really was like this, it was a snowball effect among community that was really cool. And I just think that we could use this idea of <clears throat> getting people together, doing things as a way to work together to really impact people who aren't necessarily visual artists, include them. And um, Laura had brought up a really great idea of like, what about like poets? We talked about dancers. And I know that um, Christina also had mentioned dancers, but using and music, like different forms of arts, if we worked as a coalition to get different movements that then push forward to an end goal, it might be possible. But we'd have to have, I mean, I personally think it's just, it would be a lot of um, organizing. So I don't know who's good at that. <laughs> yeah. Great. Uh, do we have another group like to speak? Can I just make an observation while people are deciding sure. if they want to talk about their work? Um, so what I'm, I'm, I'm hearing some really great things, you guys. And yeah, the 100 by 100 idea of the letters was that if you had 100 people, let's say theoretically write one letter, but then they use the other 99 people's letters, put their names on it and send it so that each place that you're passionate about gets all of those letters, then you have this massive kind of snowball. <laughs> um, but what I'm hearing is, um, I'm hearing that between the lines, a lot of us are feeling a little bit overwhelmed. There's a lot of different issues. Um, and I think that it's okay to choose one. I also heard the word, the word doable, which is really positive, right? Just choose something that you're passionate about. Maybe it's Maybe it's that you need speed bumps on your street because people are going so fast that they're expending lots of fuel and endangering people's lives. I mean, it doesn't have to be a massive, massive thing. It can be something small. Um, it doesn't matter. Like it's all in the positive direction, right? You know, up and to the right. That's what we're talking about. Um, and partnering together. Um, I don't know if maybe... Um, uh, I don't know if my group wants to talk, maybe Taryn wants to talk about, she had some good ideas about um, some of the groups that she's working with. Um, and um, partnering with artists and with organizations. I think that not all of our activism has to be art, right? It can be letter writing, it can be calling Congress people, it can be protesting, it can be, or it can be dancing, it can be doing other things, and it can be involving other people, because in my opinion, and I guess I think it's been borne out, we're kind of in these silos, right? So like you align with your people of your political and social economic values. So how do we get across those invisible barriers to include everybody in the world, not just our nation, even like everybody. Um, that's my two cents. Um, Taryn, do you wanna talk about uh, anything? Sure, I'm happy to. So um, part of the reason that I came to this is because I am also a grant writer for nonprofits. And so uh, largely advocacy nonprofits like League of Women, and voters. A former client was American Forest, which is focused on tree equity in uh, especially inner cities where they are hotter because they don't have trees. Anyway, uh, needless to say, I think that anytime we are as artists are focusing other people's attention on something we are paying attention to, there is power there. So I want to underscore that just because you are not solving the problem does not mean you're not having an impact because we are directing attention. Um, but I do think that coming together with groups that are already doing grassroots organizing and bringing them into the work or the projects that we're doing or making them aware of, of your work, um, all of those connections are going to create um, more power. 
uh, and that's and that's what we're looking for. Uh, obviously, um, also projects that are are environmental may also be eligible for arts council grants and and things like that. So I unfortunately don't freelance. Uh, I have a, a consulting firm that I work for, but uh, but do look for those area, regional, and state grants that might support uh, collaborative projects like that. Thank you. Great advice. Anybody else? Um, okay, so if you have a project, you're either interested, you're working, like if you're working with an organization or you have your own project going um, or you want to start a project, it doesn't have to be fully formed, put all the information in the chat um, here and we can save the chat. Um, Lisa with the Echo Art Caucus, um, she is the person to contact if you have some ideas um, about a project or you're working on a project, et cetera. Um, so that will be the Echo Art Caucus will kind of be the place where some of all this kind of excitement can live. Um, and I want to thank Danielle for agreeing to do this program. It was really wonderful. Um, your work is incredible and extremely inspiring. Um, you said early on, uh, uh, you had a little quote that I thought really kind of spoke to the whole thing. Um, humans ruined it, but humans can also fix it, which I found to be very inspiring. Um, and I think that's what we're all about here with the Eco Art Caucus. Uh, so our, so thank you so much for coming and, um, and agreeing to do the program. It was a really wonderful program. Our next program, and I'm going to put it in the chat is Saturday, May 11th, and it's tips to help manage your mental load for creativity with Sharon Burton. Um, the description is creatives need mental and emotional val balance for their talents to shine. This presentation explores life challenges, disrupting this balance, offering effective self-help strategies. Particip participants will also share what works for them in a peer exchange. So I'm going to copy this and put it in the chat. And that will be our last second Saturday program for the first part of the year. We'll be taking a break over the summer and then we will start up again and have programs in September, October, and November. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to say goodbye. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank Go you, forth, everybody. prosper. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Go do all your good work. <laughs>